Hello and welcome everyone to the Complete Health Podcast. I am your host, Reese Noble, and I'm here with my always wonderful and radiant co-host, <laughs> Helen O'Leary. How are Good you morning. this morning, Helen? I don't feel so radiant this morning. It's quite it's early. A bit of an early one for us here in the UK. Um, and the reason why it is a nice early one is because we had the lineup with our uh, very special guest today, who is in Auckland, New Zealand, uh, Lou James from Pink and Steel. Hi, Lou. Hi, Reese. Hi, Helen. Hi. Good morning. Good morning. Good evening. Yeah, good evening in your part of the world. Um, so again, thanks very much for being with us here, Lou. It's taken us a little while to, to line up times considering you're 13 hours ahead of us, I believe, in Auckland. Yes, yes, we are. We are well ahead of you. We've, I've already done a day's work. But it's great to be talking to you guys. We're on the other end of things. Now, we're all a bit envious of you here in the UK because um, obviously myself being from Australia, we keep seeing photos of people out with a, an, an element of freedom in, uh, in New Zealand and Australia that we currently don't have. So we're all very jealous. Yeah, I know. We are, we, we're trying to be grateful. We have just been in, in, in a little lockdown. So... Um, we, we have experienced a little bit of what you've experienced, but definitely um, we do feel for you all the way in the UK. Just a, a little sprinkle of lockdown for you. <laughs> so as I said uh, before in, uh, in the introduction, Lou is the founder and director of Pink and Steel International, who I'll leave it to Lou to explain exactly what Pink and Steel is, but they specialise in oncology or cancer rehabilitation for people, um, which is, I guess, an area that, in our undergrad training, we probably don't do a huge amount um, of in training in that area, but obviously we all know how uh, horrible cancer is and, and, and how many people it affects. So it's a, it's a, it's a huge population of people um, that, that certainly need a, a lot of help and, uh, and Lou's company is there to help with that. So Lou, without further ado, can you please tell us a little bit about yourself? How did you get into this uh, this area? And uh, what's what's Pink and Steel? Thanks, Reese. So yeah, well, I'm Lou James and I come actually come from a very small rural farming area in New Zealand. And I grew up with four brothers and I was very sporty and I always wanted to be a physio from quite a young age and I wanted to work with athletes. Um, so I, it's, it's quite a surprise to me that I've come so far in working uh, in oncology rehabilitation and that's definitely where my passion has been for the last 16 or 17 years now. So um, I think the, one of the things that drew me to it was the impact that physios can have on the lives of people with cancer and that's really why I wanted to be a physio. I wanted to help people, I wanted to make a difference and I wanted to see that difference. So uh, I, yeah, it's, it's been a bit of a surprise to me how far um, we've come on this, on this journey and that I'm talking to you in the UK. <laughs> but, it, you know, but it's, it's great, the, you know, although cancer is such a devastating disease, it's great when we can offer some help from people um, through, through that journey. So I, I really do love what I do. In New Zealand, I, um, I live with uh, my family and I have teenage boys and, and I have a really busy busy life but um, this is this is where I, I put my passion. So I'm really excited by this one because I've just finished my pink training and have signed up to literally everything else I can possibly do um, and part of that was uh, your enthusiasm when we were doing it it was kind of just infectious and the, the amount we learned was just ridiculous so can you tell us a little bit more for those who don't know what pink and steel is and how it came about? Yeah, so, so it came about, as I said earlier, from, from my own experiences as a physio. So when I was a young physio, I had my own private clinic in Auckland, New Zealand, and I was really shocked by the discrepancy between the support that was offered to our sports clients in New Zealand and then women going through cancer. Uh, and I thought this was really unfair, and I couldn't believe the impact not only physically, but also emotionally, also socially, also, you know, all aspects of these people's lives were being impacted by yeah. their cancer. And there was so little support out there, uh, especially when I started. So I really thought that was unfair and I wanted to make a difference. And then I think um, what led me to, to work more in this field is 
that it didn't take um, that much to actually make a really big effort, mm. um, make a really big change, sorry. And a part of that was there was a lot of skills that I already had as a physiotherapist that I could use to help people. Um, and a lot of it was taking the time to actually listen and hear what the issues were and learnt a lot from my clients. Because at the end of the day, our patients, you know, are, are experts in their own right as well of, of how the symptoms or how the cancer has affected them. So I, I really was passionate to learn more about how I could help. And that's how Pink and Steel started. So it started in my, as, as a clinician in my own clinic, um, I started seeing more and more people affected by cancer. And then I wanted to help more people. So I thought the best way that I could actually help more people was to train other physios to do what I do. And Pink, that's how Pink and Steel started. And I've been really delighted to meet people like you, Helen, and people, mm -hmm. other physios that also share this passion and really want to make a difference in their own communities. So, you know, now we, um, now we train physiotherapists in 18 countries. Wow. Um, I think it's growing to 20 countries pretty soon. So, so we really uh, have expanded ge geographically because cancer is affecting people all over the world. And physios are working in communities all over the world. So we're, be, we're able to now touch people in lots of different communities, uh, which, which for me is really inspiring and makes me want to want to keep working really hard so I can help facilitate um, more support for more people. Uh, Lou, are you, are you looking at um, people with certain types of cancers or do you look after everyone? Yeah, so the Pink and Steel is a, is a training academy and, and we train already experienced uh, physiotherapists how to use their skills to help people with any type of cancer. So I think there are, um, there are more supportive programs out there for maybe breast and prostate cancer because that's where a lot of the research funding has gone. Um, but I'm really passionate that we support people with any type of cancer because um, some of the rarer cancers have even less support and really yeah. struggle to know um, where the help is or if there is any help out there uh, for them. We also, you know, help people that are young, really young that are affected by cancer or really old and affected by cancer or people that have advanced disease. There's still a lot that physiotherapists can do to make sure we're improving their quality of life. Mm -hmm. And what kind of stuff have you seen change over the last year? So obviously there's been this pandemic and um, I'm guessing a lot of your rehab before or a lot of the certification before was uh, in person. But then obviously we've just done, so pink is kind of one module, which is about 12 weeks and then steals another 12 weeks slash eight weeks if you've done the next bit. Then there's another bit, then there's another bit. So it kind of keeps adding on, uh, which is great. Um, but how, how have you seen that change and how have you seen it develop over the last year? Uh, there has been some really big changes, I think, you know, worldwide because of the seismic shift of all our healthcare systems focusing on the pandemic, you know, and the hospitals being full of, of, of um, COVID and the real shift away from maybe other health conditions. So it's mm. had a huge implication for people affected by cancer. And it, that's the lockdowns and the reprioritization of the services. Um, and also the, the fact that cancer patients are at higher risk of catching things like COVID. So they even have to be even more careful um, to not, uh, you know, not be in contact with the, with, with the virus. So all those things at, combined with a lot of their follow-up services not being there, um, a lot of, you know, people that normally have follow-up services following their cancer surgery or following their treatment have, have just become non-existent. Mm -hmm. So they're really missing out on care. So, so the really big impact that we're seeing now and our clinicians are seeing now is a lot of people aren't getting things picked up early. So, you know, they're not going in to seek, seek help and, and they're not getting assessed. So little things, little um, things that may have been relatively easy to fix initially have now become a lot harder. They're, they're quite disabled by the time they come in and, and it's a real effort to get them right. And, and that is just so distressing for me, the fact that these people are at home, not getting the support they need, getting worse, um, and then it, it becomes quite a bit harder. For them to get right again and and there's a lot of people really suffering uh with with pain 
with with disabilities that, that they shouldn't have um, if, if the support was there. So, and I think it's going to get worse. I think, you know, once uh, the vaccines hopefully have an impact in COVID, uh, our, our lives go a little bit back more to normal, I think there's going to be a real influx in the need for people needing rehab that have missed out over this time. So I hope physiotherapists are ready for yeah. that impact. I think the one silver lining is that it has, it has made our, a lot of healthcare prof professionals go online and use their skills to support people online. And that has actually been really, really valuable for a lot of our people affected by cancer. Because a lot of the time, it's very difficult for them to get into places to get seen. Um, and, and, and a lot of people that live rurally or have all sorts of reasons why going into a clinic may be difficult. And so we've been able to reach those people, which I think is fantastic. And cancer can be very isolating. And even if we aren't connecting face to face, but we are connecting, you know, online like this, then we can still make a difference. So I think there has been a, a positive, um, one positive thing in the fact that um, more people are now offering online services. And with Pink and Steel, we off, we've been able to offer our um, Pink and Steel Cancer Rehab individual sessions online. We've been able to assess people. We've been able to check up on them, make sure they're progressing and change their, change their programs if need be. But also, which is really exciting, is we've been able to run our classes online. So, you know, there's yeah. been no, um, you know, there's been no way of running classes um, in the UK for, for people affected by cancer during the uh, pandemic, but we've managed to take it online and, and we've got a lot of people that are loving it. Um, and, and it's their weekly, um, you know, catch up with other people and they're doing their exercises and we're motivating them um, in between those times to keep going. So I think that's been a, a, a plus for us that we have actually been able to help people even though there has been lockdowns and restrictions. And what about your course? So how's it, def how's it impacted the Pink and Steel training? To be honest, it hasn't impacted it as much as maybe some other businesses because I've been uh, online since 2014. So because we really had the goal of trying to expand and teach more physios in more countries ge geographically, it mm -hmm. became impossible for me to travel everywhere. <laughs> uh, so I started um, going online quite early on and, and I actually found it had its benefits uh, because um, when we tried to cram all the material into um, a smaller time frame, it was quite overwhelming. It's quite mm. a lot of information, it's as you all know, over those weeks. And I think um, being able to connect with different um, people around the world and hear their views um, and take time to absorb some of the information that's coming and have a whole host of other medical professionals that are also presenting to you and mm. patients because um, I don't think it would be possible to get that many people uh, to be able to teach in person. So we have been online for a while. And I think um, for us, we've actually had an influx of um, participants yeah. because a lot of people have been lock in lockdown, Helen, and they've gone, look, Mars will do some learning. <laughs> so we've actually uh, had an influx of, of people doing our training, which, which again, is, is, is a bit of a silver lining. Yeah, fantastic to all, for all parties. I mean, obviously for you as a business, but obviously for people who are in rehab from oncology, it's uh, that's that's fantastic, a fantastic outcome. Lou, if we take you back to when Pink and Steel sort of began, what I guess for you, why are, are us as physiotherapists, you know, well placed to be looking after the oncology population? What's you, you sort of mentioned? We have pre-existing skills that fit well. Um, what what are those skills that you identified? And, uh, and, you know, um, how can, I guess, any of us be helping the, this population with, that, with our pre with the skills that we already have? Sorry, it's very early here. Yeah. <laughs> 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 I haven't had my second copy yet. I, I, think, I think one of the main things is our ability to have a therapeutic relationship with a person and the time we have. So oncology, medical uh the healthcare in oncology, the pace is really quick. Uh, you know, people see these specialists for such a short amount of time and then they're pushed out of hospital that, you know, that they're always, it's always a very quick session. Whereas we have more time where we can listen to people and develop that therapeutic relationship. And I really feel that's one of the key things is our ability to listen and, and assess and, and hear the concerns of what are going on in there 
training, we can use our, our musculoskeletal assessment skills, we can use our movement dysfunction skills, we can use our ability to assess the whole body, so not just the area impacted by cancer, not just the blood, we can, we can assess the whole body and the, and the impact that those treatments may be having on the, on, on the people. Um, also, a lot of people affected by cancer have other comorbidities, which we know about, and we can help uh, adapt their rehab program to help suit them. So, you know, a lot of times someone that may have, say, head and neck cancer also has a problem with an OA knee or something. So, you know, that one of the reasons that they aren't able to get back into exercise might also be related to a comorbidity. Mm. Um, so so our, our, our skills to be able to adapt, to understand other um, comorbidities and assess the whole body, I think is very important. And our clinical reasoning around, around why we, we are, are going to choose a certain uh, rehab um, intervention, I think is really important. Yeah. I mean, one of the things I found really useful in the training is, like you say, we brought in loads of different specialists. And what's really nice is I think physios are really well placed to work within a massive MDT. We do it all the time. Even if you're working in private practice, you, you don't think about it, but you do it all the time. You know, on a daily basis, we've got physios, osteos, the Pilates mm. instructors, we've got the sports docs and the consultants that we're working with and we're talking to every day. And in the course, you brought in kind of breathing experts and lymphedema experts and um, palliative care experts and all this kind of stuff. And, and you'll sit there and it, it doesn't feel, um, that side of it doesn't feel awkward and overwhelming because you feel mm. like you can, you can talk to that side of it because yeah. it feels like you yeah. sit in there really nicely. And almost like you can kind of see all these different things so you can kind of make sure that people are doing all those right things, whether it be the exercise or referring off to lymphedema specialists or something like that. And you can pick that up quite quickly. Um, which is really quite nice. Yeah, absolutely. I think uh, cancer rehab re is really important to have interprofessional relationships. Yeah. And I think we're actually really good at that. We're used to doing that. So yeah, definitely good point, Helen. That, that, I think that's a really key thing that we're involved in as well. And also education. Like yeah. uh, a lot of the time people need to understand uh, things that are relevant to them yeah. so you know they need to understand how they can help themselves what they can do to, to you know get in the driver's seat and actually do something rather than a lot of, a lot of the time the medical treatments are just done to them mm -hmm. um, and so we can actually explain and then they can get some understanding and that understanding I think is really really important in terms of them taking doing their own self-management and then being able to look after themselves going yeah. forward well, with, because with cancer being a, a systemic issue, it's going to affect everything, but not just on the physical side of things, also on the you know more psychosocial side of things as well, isn't it? So I guess having that uh, resource that brings, like Helen was just saying, all of those experts together mm. is just a, a, a fantastic resource for, for both therapists and, and um, cancer sufferers and, and survivors as well. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. One, one thing I want to say there is don't, I think physios shouldn't underestimate their ability to also help the psychological side of someone's recovery. I think we often think we're focused on the physical and we are, but a lot of the time, if we can help people reconnect with their bodies, if we can help people move better, if we can help people gain some physical mm -hmm. strength, they gain a lot of, of mental strength as well. And um, one of our, our physios is a psychologist as well as being a physio. And he, he said, tells me that people are more often open to him about what's really going on when he's in his physio role other than his psychology role. I'm not saying we're psychologists, but I'm not saying to take over. But, but we also do play a really key role in, in that psychological um, part of, of someone's cancer journey. And, and we, should, we, should, we should be proud of that. Yeah, and I, I agree with that more than anything. Um, so I did do sport and then came into private practice. And the reason I kind of started the Pilates side of it is because A, I had an hour with someone and B, a client would be sat in the waiting room in shorts and t-shirt ready to move and just mm. that responsibility. And then you get to spend an hour with people. I mean, I often said that my sarcasm made people better. I mean, not what I did, but just, you know, my general sarcasm. <laughs> and, and I think that is a really massive thing because you do have that time to develop the relationship and they, mm. they kind of tell you bits and pieces and they start to feel comfortable, but because they feel um, like they have the ability to change things for themselves, it's a very mm. different mindset that they can put them into and that sense of achievement and, and that sense of kind of, worth that you're doing it for you is is mm. i think massive so that being said 
I mean, I know what it's like in the UK, but but do people for you in Auckland naturally get referred into exercise and physios if they get a cancer diagnosis? Not naturally. I, I don't know. What, <laughs> so unfortunately, the answer is no, it's not a natural progression. Progression. I mean, the, the amount of evidence out there that says that the benefits of regular physical activity really should be mandatory in cancer care. But there is, it's not just a natural flow. I mean, there is in some organizations now, some organizations are, are getting a lot better and people are, you know, they're doing exercise during the chemotherapy or this, that's getting set up even now in prehab and, and some organizations, which is great. So some organizations, yes, there is a more of a natural flow, but a lot um, there in most places that doesn't happen. And in a lot of places, uh, even if it's offered, people aren't necessarily taking it up. So, um, yeah, I mean, that's the goal and hopefully it, it, it will start getting more that it is a natural flow and, and most people are doing it. But because of the comorbidities, because of the different impairments, because of the complexities, it's, it's not necessary that all exercise is going to be right for people. Uh, so, so I think there are people that often miss, miss the gap and often they are the ones that need that one-on-one -on -one, um, stuff the most. But I think that's what makes it so important for also for all of us to keep raising the awareness of this so that people know that exercise is such an important part and rehab is such an important part of their recovery from cancer. Like we wouldn't expect someone that's got injured that wants to run a marathon to do it on their own. And yet we expect someone that's gone through chemotherapy treatment, surgeries, radiation therapy, a whole lot of, of these things happen to them and, and, and they don't expect that they're going to need some help with rehab and exercise to get back mm. to their normal lives again. So hopefully, you know, by working together and all sharing the message of how important it is and how there is help out there, I think, I think that's, that's really important for all of us to do. It's amazing. We're, we're sort of having a similar combina uh, conversation with people of different fields. So we had uh, Claire Pacey, who's a women's health, pelvic health expert, and we were talking about post-birth and we were having the same conversation about, well, you know, if someone does their ACL, we wouldn't expect them to do it by themselves. So why in the recovery postnatally would we expect the same? And, and the same mm. theme is exactly the same yeah. here. And I think that's such an important message to get out. Mm. Um, we should almost treat everyone like those athletes that we're trying to get back yeah. to to their sport might just be life. Um, and, and that's super, super important. Um, Lou, we're just talking about exercise is sort of my wheelhouse. It's, uh, it's my <laughs> favorite area. So in regards to that with people who uh, are currently going through cancer or have survived and are hopefully on the, on the free side of things, is there exercises that you recommend more than any other or a style of exercise or is it very much a, an individual type of, uh, type of thing? I think, yeah, I think when you talk about cancer, it's easy to sort of think it's one disease, but there's actually 200 different types of cancer and it manifests differently in each individual. So it's a lot of different things going on. Uh, <laughs> So it, 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 is, it does need to be individualized, but, but in saying that, there does need to be a cardiovascular element. So the research now coming through is very strong that people need to do cardiovascular exercise and it should be um, you know, 150 minutes of moderate intensity cardiovascular exercise. That is the goal that, that, that we're wanting to get you know, people doing. And that's important. There also should be resistance exercises. So chemotherapy, hormone therapy treatments, a lot of the treatments impact um, our bone and our muscle health. And so doing resistance exercises is really important. Um, people that are affected by cancer are at a higher risk of a number of chronic diseases like uh, heart disease, like diabetes, like metabolic syndrome, like uh, osteoporosis and functional decline and, and other cancers. And so exercise actually also helps protect them against those. So cardiovascular exercise, resistance exercise, at least two times a week is really important. But also people need to do flexibility and strength, uh, stretching exercises because a lot of the times they have scar tissue or radiation and things which constrict things. So they, they really need to do that. Also now there's research coming through about the importance of relaxation or mindfulness or, or you know, more restorative types of exercise as well um, as being a really important part. 
uh, of recovery. So I think, and, and balance exercises mm. too, actually, because uh, the cancer treatments have a really big impact on balance. So actually, in terms of type of exercise, I think what people need is a variety of exercises. Uh, and obviously, as, as physiotherapists, we would choose the appropriate exercise for each person. Because I think that's the key, you know, we don't have to wrap people up in cotton wool. Uh, if they are strong enough um, or, or capable, we can push them with exercise, you know, that, that that's going to be good for them. But we need to um, use our clinical reasoning to decide what that is, because if everyone is just doing really low rate exercise, they're not going to get the gains and the outcomes that they could be getting if they're pushed at the level that they need to be pushed at. So, so again there, Lou, I, I always, when, you know, talking about the minimal standards of exercise and things like that. That's what everyone should be doing, right? Yeah. You know, 150 yeah. minutes plus some resistance training, balance, a bit of mobility. And it's no different for cancer patients. Like I, I think, and, and one thing that stood out, I can remember from one of my uni, in my master's subjects that we did, we did an oncology unit. And they said, basically, it doesn't matter how bad the person feels because things like chemo are going to be horrible on the body it's really important to keep them exercising mm. and finding a way for these people to, to, to keep their physical fitness up. Um, and it, it is, it's just such an important message for, for all populations. But I, I think that's a really important message for cancer, pe uh, cancer patients, that mm. exercise is just, just so important. Yeah. And I think, I think we need to do a bit of work with, with people too, because we, we understand how important it is. Yeah. But when you're feeling fatigued, yeah. when you've lost confidence in your body because you don't know why you've got cancer and, and it's not doing the things you want it to do, when, you know, when you're struggling with depression and you're anxious about every ache and pain you get, you know, you can see why they don't just run out and go and do exercise. So we, we yeah. really, I think we really have to bridge the gap and help them, help them under, understand the importance of it and show them practically what they can do. I don't think you can just throw someone a pamphlet or send them on an app and go you know exercise I think actually that's the skill of that's why we're so important in this field is, is, is we need to actually help people take those steps um, and when they see that those they're getting some benefit then then they become lifetime um, you know exercises which I think should be our goal yeah absolutely and I think that message is a wonderful one to finish on for episode one with Lou um, again, as we always do, we've managed to fill half an hour very, very quickly. Um, but uh, some good messaging in there, I think, for patients and therapists alike uh, in the importance of exercise and that there are resources available for, um, for looking after people with cancer and if you have it yourself. So certainly head along to the Pink and Steel website. Um, we are very, very quickly going to be going into episode two with Lou, where we're going to continue with this conversation. Um, so again, thanks, Lou, and uh, we'll see you again very soon. See you later. Bye. Thank you for having me. <laughs> Bye.